think it's one of the, 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 the difficult things to figure out is what is believed to be true and what is reality with state regulations related to the scope of the midwife, right? If you're in a state mm -hmm. where there's supervisory authority, the yeah. language might be very different. Right. Uh, but for me in the state of Missouri, uh, we were not uh, required to have that kind of supervision. And not only did we admit and discharge the mother, but we admitted and discharged the normal newborn. So we had couplet care in our practice uh, for 10 years. Uh, so that's, that's one issue. The other is I really urge that we start thinking about getting temporary privileges or guest privileges until we have permanent privileges, which is what a lot of physicians do. They can't wait for four to five months to start seeing patients and delivering them. Why are they making midwives do that? There's really no reason that you can't ask to have temporary privileges and start seeing patients in the hospital. But a lot of people don't think about doing that. So Ginger, back to a comment that you made about um, just before we got onto this, you said something about the privileges do not, um, they should not include ambulatory. Right. So ours do, and I asked about that, and they said, no, that this network requires that to be in there. And that didn't make sense to me, but I didn't fight it. It seems very strange. Yeah, I think what you're going to have to do is, is educate them. And so my first question very gently to the right person would be, do you, um, do you regulate so if they have a hospital uh, physicians that are laborists that work for them, right? Yes, you know, yes two of them. Do they, do they approve laborers. all their ambulatory care practices? I, I mean, I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt it, too. So it's a matter of, of sort of trying to, to be an equivalent to, to how other credentialed providers are treated. You may have a different scope of care, but you certainly should not be monitored in the ambulatory world when no one else is. Okay. Melinda? I was going to say, one of the, you know, we have full scope authority practice in the, in the state of Nevada, but what we're dealing with with the hospitals is, and, and the insurance companies is they're saying that something about their, their accreditation is requiring that they require supervision for us in the, in the hospitals and to be credentialed with the insurance companies. You know, Melinda, I, you were on Joe's call on vicarious liability. Yes, I was. <laughs> you, you all are teetering on a restraint of trade case and those take years. I, I keep thinking I'm getting old enough to pursue one of those. Uh, and Joe, off, offline, when we were done, basically was talking about that. I think you may be facing people saying things to dissuade you from persisting. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, that's just a first blush because there isn't anything regulatory that that stands on. Yeah. It's, it's seen as being, you know, this is what one of the legislators told me. It's seen as being the businesses have the right to do what they want to do unless we put something into law that says they can't do that. So what I would say, and then we'll move on, is, is survey the rest of the midwives in your state. See if you can find a precedent where someone has succeeded. Have some meetings with them. Find, you know, the physicians, the payers, the midwives. See if you can... Uh, find that practice, and mm -hmm. then you've got a little more ground to go forward in conversation. So far as I know, there isn't one. But, yeah. but anyhow, if I can so, get my purse in. <laughs> we, we know you're trying. Uh, <laughs> there's so much to do. There's so much to do. Um, the next resource I'm going to take you to is the ACOG Collaboration and Practice guide, uh, Implementing Team-Based Care. I'm going to jump to their site right now. That was the year-long project of Dr. John Jennings. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little story because Dr. Jennings is an 
absolute uh, supporter of midwifery, all midwifery that is ICM approved. When Dr. Jennings was elected, um, they get a one-year term, and he wanted to get a million moms on the mall and uh, created a PowerPoint that he shared with me several years ago called the Big Harry Audacious Goal, his BHAG. He presented it before the ACOG board and staff, and they said, no, you can't do that. And this is what he ended up doing, which happened to be during my time as president, was working on collaboration and practice with the second tier coming out of that interprofessional education. And this collaboration and practice team-based toolkit from ACOG has been downloaded more than just about any other recent tool. I see you smiling, Barb. It is a tremendous, again, association document that has helped validate midwifery on a national scale. And um, what's really fantastic about it is I mean, there's 20 some organizations, I'm not gonna belabor us here with who they were, but um, a task force that was multidisciplinary. It truly was a product of people sitting around the table together, creating the chapters, writing the chapters. Uh, our two midwives that were on this, uh, Kathy Collins Fillet and uh, Mary Ann Fosher, actually led two of the work groups that produced chapters. And it is really a great um, guidepost to, to bring out of the closet or to hand to someone who's an OBGYN who honestly may not even know this document exists. One of, the, one of the profound things that I have learned, especially being around national level conversations, is things may be said at a national level, but sort of like translational research to get it to the community level for it to be implemented is a completely different story. But sometimes in our profession, and in ACOG, and with CPMs, all of us, we don't know what we don't know. We're so busy, we don't know what documents exist out there. And we simply just haven't taken the time to think about the content. And it can be an unfortunate roadblock. But there's a wonderful executive summary here that talks you through uh, what this 60-some page free resource is. Um, and I would really urge you to be aware of its existence. There are, there are some favorite uh, sections that I'll give to you in just a minute that I think are great uh, as leading um, concepts within this paper uh, that can get you some traction pretty quickly and I'll share those in just a minute. But I would love to know if any of you know about the document, if you've used the document, um, if you've had any success with it. Hi Pam. Ginger, yeah. I'd just like to reinforce what you said. In fact, this document is um, one of the resources that we use throughout the Midwifery Integration Guide, and there's a link to it. Um, so people can actually go directly to it. Um, and being able to define what does collaboration mean um, and value the contributions of midwives as well as physicians is a great way to build that trusting relationship, which we know is critical in clinical practice. Yeah. I think the other thing this document did, which is carried forward by PBGH, is this concept of team-based care. It goes along right in line with the ACOG uh, joint statement that midwives are autonomous, independent providers within a team. So it begins to tone down Melinda that concept of supervision. Uh, in fact, there's less vicarious liability if you are practicing independently, right? We just had that lecture. Uh, so this concept of team-based care is really carried through this document uh, with examples. Others? Sherilyn, have you used this? I haven't. Uh, you talked about it in the presentation that you did, and that's one of my goals. Yeah. To start digesting it. Yeah. Um, I'm, again, I'm going to give you my favorite sections of it here in a minute. Um, Regina, did you learn about it in your program? 
I do not believe that we did. I do not remember referring to that at all. Yeah. So as a, as a new graduate, someone going out seeking employment, one of the benefits of you knowing about this is to help frame um, what, what is an endorsed model of how midwives and physicians should be working together. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think the more informed you are when you go into those interviews and when you ask people about the practice model and, hey, did you know about this? And this is really, you know, what might be a, you know, a, a great thing to hear more about from your uh, interview. Um, lots of, lots of great ideas. There. Yeah, that's so, what I was already thinking about, that this would be a yeah. great resource to start helping me prepare for interviewing. Yeah. Is, um, is this available or is it behind the, their um, you've got to be a member. It's freely, freely downloaded. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. In, yeah. In North Carolina, we've given all of our legislators a copy of this. Great um, idea. To educate them about what it means, what collaboration really means. You know, Great idea. With us working with OBGYNs. Yeah, I, I have a little bit of experience with some OBGYNs in North Carolina. I actually have an RN license there. Um, you don't claim them if you're talking about well, this one person. Well, you know, I, I think it's important to, to sort of say it was, it was a good example for me not working with them as a clinician, but in a different role to understand how much they really didn't know. What, what does the word collaboration mean? And what does my, meaning the ACOG professional organization, think? And when we started talking about it, here's my favorite sections, chapter one, chapter two and chapter four with the page numbers there for you. They're like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, right? You can be a member, but it doesn't mean you're up to date with what's being said by your professional association. And I can't fault people for that. I remember years when I was such a busy practitioner, I barely had time to take care of my four little kids and run a practice. Um, but I think if you can strategize about how you use the document, not here, read it, you need to change, but sort of engage in what this could bring to the relationship that is of value to them. They're much more willing to listen than to feel like they're doing something wrong and they're supposed to figure out how to fix it. It just, we all know that, it doesn't work that way. But the rarely used resource part, I think, is both from both professions. Spark, 